Island mm. in Southeast Alaska. Beautiful islands though, beautiful island people. I mean, we consider those our northern cousins, you know, and all people who touch the ocean, as we, Dan had said that, you know, Lahaina had hosted the island of Maui, even near Leahi Diamond Head, um, on the island of Oahu, they hosted many paddle outs this past, um, you know, over the past week to honor those in Lahaina, to honor the island of Maui. But when we take back those places through our in indigenous tongue, then we really do allow for more power and, you know, more knowledge to kind of come to those places. Absolutely. So this is an ongoing effort still? to do this rename? Mm-hmm. Okay. Currently, yep, up uh, the Prince of Wales Island, yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of the spaces throughout, you know, in Alaska, when we were talking to some of them, they have had success, but, um, you know, others are still kind of hoping for that change, and uh, they often joked, they said, next time when Hokulea comes up here, it's not gonna be called Prince of Wales <laughs> Island. <laughs> so. Yeah, we were laughing the other day when we were diving on King George Seamount. We said, how'd Georgie get this seamount? Come on, <laughs> come on. Named after a ship, I supposedly, that was yeah. uh, active in this area and probably commissioned and paid for by King George uh, in the late 1700s. Yeah, there's yeah. a, you know, that's it's very common throughout the oceans that uh, some of these islands and seamounts have an indigenous name and a Western name. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the uh, hotspot tracks I've done a lot of work on uh, uh, has uh, an active volcano related to it in the Cook Austral Islands. Um, Western science uh, knows the seamount where we believe that hotspot is currently located as uh, Arago Seamount, or Arago, I'm not sure which is the proper pronunciation, but that was named after a uh, French ship. But I was digging around in some uh, geological literature on it. Um, couple of years ago, maybe a year ago. I don't know, time kind of blurs together sometimes. But uh, I was reading one of the papers uh, that went into the geochemistry of some rocks recovered from uh, the seamount. And there was a mention in it that um, the locals uh, called that seamount uh, Tinomana. Oh. It's, a, it's a very shallow seamount. It's, it's uh, still submarine, but it's, it's only a few tens of uh, meters down, so the locals used, uh, the locals are used aware of it, it and used <laughs> to fish. And so I found that, I'm like, why was it renamed? And, but that was when it was, uh, that was when it became known to Western science and it was, it was given that name in uh, the 90s and uh, been starting to push for people to, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to make this effort now, you know, it's only just beginning because uh, I'm at the point where I can uh, uh, revisit some of this research at conferences. And uh, I, I'm pushing to try to reclaim that indigenous name. Uh, so uh, so yeah, us, uh, Western scientists know it as uh, Arago Seamount, but the locals know it as Tinomana. And I, I did a little digging trying to figure out uh, the origins of that name. As far as I could tell, it's uh, it's named for um, one of the uh, for a queen uh, of uh, one of the islands, one of the societies there. So I think know, uh, I'm trying to help bring that back to what I believe is the proper name. Indigenous well, queen about. deserves it more than a more than a French ship, I'd say. And yeah, I mean, how insulting! We were the Sandwich Islands for a while. What the heck? Come on. Yeah. Yes. Come on. Oh my gosh. Come on. Learning that when I was a child, I never understood. I was sandwich aisles. I don't see how our islands are like sandwich. I think that was the name of an earl, right? It was. Yeah, yeah it was a region in, in England, Oy. and, and uh, but but still it makes still just as little sense. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was the habit and custom of uh, those early and even present day colonizing okay. communities to. Uh, yeah. To decide to name things after things that were familiar to them, and uh, it's hard to forgive, but mm -hmm. can also understand the desire to maintain your connection to home mm -hmm. when you're so far away. And, um, and but I think that this uh, move to around the world, I think, um, I hope, I hope it's in many communities. It's great to hear that it's happening in indigenous communities around the Pacific. Um, I know Hokulea hopes to highlight that on our Moana Nui Akea 
uh, voyage over the next few years. But uh, you know, the, the naming names do have mana, and they carry deep kauna, layers of meaning. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, you really can know a place. Um, you know, these names were often given before many, many layers of reasons um, mm -hmm. that that add uh, add to the story and. Uh, it detracts from the story to just make up a new name that doesn't mm -hmm. have carry all of that history with it. So, yeah, yeah. a little more information about Tinomana. Uh, Tinomana Mariana Ariki was a sovereign of the Cook Islands. She was the Ariki of the Tinomana dynasty, a chiefdom of the uh, Puaikura. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Maybe not. Puaikura tribe on the island of Rarotonga. She was the second Ariki of importance and position next to Makea Takao. Wow. So it's just a little blurb from uh, Wikipedia. Ariki yeah. is the uh, sort of South Polynesian, the, the Tahitian, Maori, Cook Island uh, equivalent of Ali'i, our chief. Um, so just a, s a slight change in the language, although all of our languages around the Pacific quite quite They're related. They're very closely related, yeah. Related to one another, so that's uh, that's beautiful. But yeah, it's, uh, the queen queen deserves to have a Sima. That's Glad, she, glad she's going to get it back. I'm going to try. It's, it's not always <laughs> go, easy to change a name. Yeah, amazing. I'm excited. Hawaiian Airlines, a little plug. Uh, you know, they're not a sponsor. I'm not paid for this, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm excited because they just opened up a nonstop flight from Honolulu to Raro, to Rarotonga in the Cook oh, Islands. Oh, that's awesome. So you used to have to fly through New Zealand or, or Australia um, to, to get down there and uh, I haven't visited yet but we have many voyaging friends and, and family from there and mm -hmm. um, actually one of the science communication fellows that was on board earlier in this expedition season in the last year awesome Hawaiian Malanai mm -hmm. um, oh Malanai voyaging she's captain. fantastic she's mm -hmm. and she is also a hammer mm -hmm. yeah and, I, uh, uh, <laughs> I sailed with her on 138 last year excellent she, she made a sail just recently from Cook Islands to Samoa Oh really? Yeah, wow. on, on a voyaging canoe, yeah. So wow. really, really special, yeah. She's she's great. Yeah, she and I spent a lot of time on that expedition talking about some of the parallels we could draw between uh, uh, how the Hawaiian hotspot and uh, the islands formed and how they work, yeah. and uh, a lot of parallels with um, a, a lot of uh, uh, traditional Hawaiian stories, the little, mythology. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. You know, because a, a lot of that is um, in in story form, a way of understanding the world around you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's encoding uh, the same processes, just uh, you know, utilizing uh, different different methodologies and different and, language, uh, different languages. Yeah. But it's uh, it's it's uh, similar or same understandings, you know, expressed mm -hmm. differently. Both both of them powerful and important. So. Very much so. That's awesome. Kukui, you had mana'o to share? Hit us with it, Kukui. Shine your light. Oh. If you didn't, just make something up. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll love it. I to put you on the spot. We'll I had a great to try to... <laughs> oh, no, it is beautiful. Beautiful to, to continue to make those connections. Um, not only with our cousins across um, Oceania, but you know, across the whole world, because I like this uh, saying that I heard one time that each of us um, will know somebody with at least three connections. And so it kind of shows you how closely tied the world is becoming once again. And so I just want to mahalo you guys for for this discussion and for this topic. Um, and I think it, that it's really needed to be, to be um, uplifted and shared as well. I Mm -hmm. Mahalo. You know, this past, um, earlier this year, I had the privilege of returning back to uh, Zion, Utah. Mm, um, if beautiful. anyone has been there before, this time I went with my mother and younger brother. It was their first time. Uh, and just seeing, you know, like the iron red sandstone and the structures. And I mean, it just whisked you into like a, another world. Um, but then I also learned that the indigenous name is actually Makuntuwi uh, by the Paiute people. Um, the name of that area and the literal translation it actually means straight canyon. And you know, speaking of our kauna and how Hawaiian language, there's a lot of symbolism, there's deeper meanings, there's multiple meanings and it's layers um, just kind of wrapped up into just one word. And I just kind of wonder about what other layers are wrapped up into that word for that place. 
um, because that is um, a sanctuary, it's a chapel, it's a place of, you know, what I see as worship to them. Um, and it got its name changed by Mormon uh, settlers and pioneers kind of exploring and settling in that area. So I think when we do come back to those names, we empower that place, we empower those people, um, and we uplift their stories and their ancestral uh, connection. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. Mahal, I, I really love this. Um, you know, it goes back to your conversations with Malanai and also about the naming of, of Zion and mm -hmm. uh, by the Paiute people. And, and because they saw things over generations mm -hmm. and because they saw things as in such an expansive way, mm -hmm. right? Almost like they could look down from a satellite, you know, hundreds <laughs> of years ago, thousands of years ago, they could see their place so intimately, but from this broader perspective, you know, this interconnected perspective, this, mm -hmm. and uh, it's really just fascinating because it feels like they must have had access to some sort of uh, viewing technology that they didn't have. It was, it was just that they were so deeply connected that the Hawaiians, right, they couldn't see the archipelago stretching thousands mm -hmm. of miles, but they could, they could voyage, they, they could, could make voyages, it, yeah. they could navigate mm -hmm. that. And, and from there, they could see how each island changes the closer mm -hmm. you get to the volcanoes. Yeah, exactly. The, the active volcanoes. They're all volcanoes, yeah, but the active really ones. really amazing that they could sort of uh, come to understand this story just through that generational deep connection to a place. And uh, a lot of people, um, be, as the world has been globalized and we've been moving around and been kind of uh, untethered from our relationship to a deep relationship to place, we now depend on our technologies for that incredible and beautiful view of our places, mm -hmm. that interconnected view. But I think it's still part of us, you know, it's part of every every human being's foundational to our to who we are as human beings, that we have the capacity to kind of reach through space and time to mm -hmm. understand a bigger story about ourselves. And, and I think, uh, you know, these expeditions, this time with all of you on board, we keep talking about how powerful it is. But to me, as I'm processing a lot of the learning, I'm just thinking, oh, for me, I feel empowered as well, mm -hmm. that I can see my place in, in a more holistic, a broader, a, a, a transcendent kind of a way, like mm -hmm. just be able to understand it over time and, and over vast areas. It's one of the gifts of coming into Papahanaumokuakea for sure mm -hmm. with all of you. So mm -hmm. really amazing. And with, and with indigenous cultures, you know, these these people have been in these places for a long time. So they're mm -hmm. able to adopt that broader view by uh, being there and, you know, learning and passing that down for uh, subsequent generations to continue building on. And it, yeah. it just becomes this, this very deep, very intimate understanding of, of these places. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So we're, with technology, one could argue that we may be doing something similar, even if, you know, some of us are more transient mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we have different ways of uh, bringing together all of this knowledge and building on it still. Yeah. It's helping us uh, in this age maintain that connection. We, If we use it the right way, I know at Purple Maya Foundation that I mentioned earlier, it's really our hope that you know, technology can be a force for helping us look through time and space, see our places, see how treasured they are, see how much they matter across generations. It can be that thing. Uh, it can be, those tools can be used for that. They don't just have to be for uh, distraction or addiction <laughs> or, yeah. you know, uh, they can be for deep connection, uh, deep reality, not just, uh, you know, not just uh, trying to get through, you know, the next few hours. Uh, so it's yeah, it's really. I have a lot of hope for that. It's going to be going to be tricky um, mm -hmm. to navigate this over the next few generations here, but I think um, definitely have have a lot of hope. Have loved talking with so many students uh, on board. Mm -hmm. Had a great great group of students. Don't know if they're tuning in now. They might be out of school already. Uh, they're on the East Coast, but got to hang out with uh, some students from uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, uh. High school students who were you know, about to graduate high school and, and could see uh, a lot of anticipation and eagerness and curiosity and, and exploration in their eyes. And I think they, you know, a lot of young people are craving this kind of uh, bigger, bigger understanding, this sort of, uh, this sense of being a, being a part of a community and a place and a planet that is, uh, that is more than just, uh, 
you know, online shopping and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and you know. Yeah. And I, I always remember that story you told us, Daniel, about that one OPO who um, tried on the argumented reality goggles and the joy that sparked in their eyes. It, mm. it really shares how much technology can bring us again and also help us learn and facilitate that learning and bring it to others as well. Oh, yeah, mahalo for reminding me of Hanale and his dream. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's amazing that Aboriginal Australians, Indigenous Australians, they would they would call their voyaging dream time. Mm -hmm. And I think about it, even on board the Nautilus or on board Hokuleo, traveling into Papahanaumokuakea, connecting to the world in this way almost feels like a dream. Yeah. It's like, not the dream like, hey, it's my dream to uh -huh. go to the Super Bowl, but like our actual kind of like just transported, like, all of the different dimensions can kind of uh, and kind of fold into one another and you're allowed to be with a place in a way that's exceptionally special and unique mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. maybe that's contributing to the feeling a lot of us are getting probably everybody's getting during these dives where suddenly you just kind of feel like you're in this really surreal state we've, yeah. we've heard a few people describe uh, describe some of these experiences on this expedition as surreal. Yeah. Online viewers, there have been no substances involved in no. any of any of this. Well, so maybe we, some we, caffeine. We, oh yeah, that's true. That's true. Plenty of caffeine. Uh, plenty of caffeine. We should drink some more water. But no, but it's, <laughs> it's it's just the immersion into mm -hmm. this very different part of our our world that we never get to see t uh, uh, on land. Yeah, Most definitely. That's true. Yeah, yeah that actually. Um, I had a great kumu and mentor, Kaleo Manuiva Wong, he, before leaving um, Hilo Port for our destination in Kahiki and Tahiti, he had mentioned to all of the crew members that when we go on these voyages, when we go on these expeditions, uh, people, you know, we are stepping into Po and it is almost like, he used the word that we're like, we are going to sleep. And I associate that with the immersion and the dream state and this, um, surreal feeling of you know operating working being in a different a different place in a different realm mm -hmm. yeah amazing to be there now with all of you what a dream yeah, yeah. a dream indeed For those who are more interested in the winch than our dreams, uh, <laughs> we, we are about a thousand meters um, from the ship and we are proceeding uh, carefully, always taking care of our line and uh, examining, making sure the winch is, uh, is all set to go. But we are proceeding and just had our expedition, co-expedition lead Megan Cook uh, in the house with us, uh, making sure we weren't totally losing our minds going off into dreamland. <laughs> no, she, she was doing a great job making sure that Atalanta is safe. I think we we may have one or possibly two more dives uh, with Atalanta only. So, and we'll need Atalanta throughout this expedition. So, critical to uh, take good care to Malama, the ROV and and the cable um, that brings the ROV to life. So. Yeah, one of the one of the big things that uh, Daniel and uh, Megan, our uh, expedition leaders, have been driving home is take care of the people, take care of the equipment. Mm -hmm. yeah. The rest will follow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we've got uh, viewers said, is this the right depth for deep squids? It is now. It is now. I uh, I should pass it over to somebody with biological knowledge, but. I think we just saw one, actually. What? Yeah, yeah we've actually oh, seen no. two, I think. Wow, well, well, you should have flagged us. Just right? let me ramble on while there was... <laughs> yeah, I know, right? We don't want to interrupt squids attacking you. Atalanta? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I clicked uh, capture, so we got pictures of at least one of them. Oh, my so. gosh. Yes, awesome. Virginia. Mm -hmm. Love it. Virginia is still doing the job, mm -hmm. even <laughs> while the rest of us are off in uh, La La Land. Just talking story. <laughs> talking story. <laughs> You Sometimes gotta watch. You gotta, gotta watch these story. Hawaiians. Huh? Know, you gotta yeah. Watch these Hawaiians. They just start. Kuka, don't, kuka. <laughs> don't give us the mic. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I do that. All, all, all the Pahinas, one friend. No, he doesn't no, get the mic. I have the mic. <laughs> he somehow always finds mic. it. No, take it away. 
Who the other night I spent a little too much time talk story and just uh, uh -huh. didn't move off of that one spot on yeah. the social deck for a while. And uh -huh. uh, Malia, who who, would, uh, who I had eaten dinner with in that very mm -hmm. same spot, she came by a couple hours later and she, she said, did you turn into a pohaku? <laughs> <laughs> Val's dream. Speaking of Val's dream, she is now a pohaku. Oh, she, no. she is an ancient volcanic stone. Yes, sometimes. Oh, no. It's always That's so funny. lively. It depends on how creaky I feel getting out of bed some mornings. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Well, now we're on squid watch and. Uh, it almost, I almost started making some SpongeBob references, but uh, <laughs> just in honor of Catalina. But uh, I'll, maybe I'll save all of our online viewers. I don't know how many SpongeBob fans we have out there. Mm -hmm. I you might be surprised. I, I, I almost made the reference earlier when we were talking about marching bands. <laughs> that that, been is, a good good <laughs> that is a good episode. That is a good So yeah, squids. <laughs> I think I caught Virginia at a bad moment. <laughs> I see one in the distance there. One of our favorite cephalopods. Yeah, it's coming. It's squids. coming. Sorry, was that my intro to just start talking about squids? <laughs> yeah, we see some. Sure. They're, they're kind of off in the distance or being oh, a little camera shy. Yeah. Yeah, were you guys able to see anything that would give you an idea of like genus or whatever? Nope. Or, okay. It was orange. Um, I got, well, let me see. Let me, let me go there was a big orange it. squid on camera and I totally missed it. Oh Dude, me too. Gosh, what the? It wasn't that large. Okay. <laughs> I almost missed it. Luckily, Virginia was on it and caught a good uh, still cap of it. <laughs> Somebody's doing some work up here at least. <laughs> the rest of us sit around and talk story. I try. Yeah, it looked like it had, um, I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of a pelagic squid. It's not that large. Um, okay. It doesn't have any any truly defining characteristics that I can mention, except for the fact that it looks very similar to what I've seen at shallower depths okay. moving around in the um, in this pelagic zone. It's uh, yeah, but um, yeah, I'm actually not positive how many types of uh, pelagic squid there are in this region. I'd imagine that there are several. Um, and then you've also got all of the larger, the larger squid, which are always exciting to think about seeing. I've Do those come up to the surface sometimes? Surface, not positive, but they would they would um, migrate with any prey species as well. So, okay. Um, we've seen, I, I believe, I saw a uh, a big fin squid. We were in the mid Pacific seamounts and the deepest we went there was about 3,000 meters deep and we saw it when we were returning to the surface so um. yeah I remember we'd see squids occasionally uh, in 2013 mm -hmm. down in uh, uh, the uh, uh, down in Tuvalu um, and they'd sometimes circle around the dredge bag when we were pulling up mm -hmm. our rocks Oh yeah, you know, squids are, and the other thing too is a lot of them, I mean, they're attracted to the light too, mm -hmm. so it's, it's not, it's, it's, it is very common to see squid when you're coming back on, on deck, and, and actually, I mean, I, I'm not positive that, that it's the same species, but there are, um, you know, you turn the light on on the back deck, um, actually we used to do it all the time, uh, when you put a CTD down on some of the back of the boats, Right, that's a, or a, with a rosette of niskins on it, you can um, deploy it off the side of the boat with a light to make sure that, you know, to, to look at the, as the wire's hanging. And so if there's a light there, sometimes it can take, you know, a couple hours to get that, that nis those niskins to the sea floor and then de deploy them and then take, bring them back up. And by the end of those couple hours, you'll have a school of squid just hanging out under the light and, and eating things. And um, it's really wonderful to see, actually. It's pretty I great. I can imagine. Sounds delicious. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> oh, I'm we, sorry. Yeah. I'm no, sorry. we, we okay. did have some, uh, we've had some people in the past who have 
utilize those uh, <laughs> those lights <laughs> um, fishing. So. Good. I'm yeah. glad they didn't go to waste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do love a good squid salad at a sushi oh. restaurant. Mm. So good. Is it lunchtime? Almost. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah, it's it's got a little better. while. Got a little over an hour. Yeah. Speaking of food, <laughs> um, you know, oh no. I'm just, well, okay, to be honest, I've been thinking about the mole of tacos oh, and burrito mole. that Dan was talking about. And okay, I was we got to go to Las Cruces, too, on our tour. I, I don't know how we're going to get a ship there, but we'll, oh, we'll do Las Cruces it. is oh. such good food. Yeah, oh my gosh. But I'm really curious to know what, what is a food that you guys miss while you're at sea or, or just away from home, you know, and the first place you got to stop at right when you arrive in port or at the airport when we've all been a away from home for so long aside from ohana family you know cooking and your mom's food what is the one place your one fix mm. Mm. well when we're coming in and out of honolulu mm -hmm. poke yeah no, no, some poke. Mm -hmm. and there's a great poke shop right next to uh the pier that we dock at yeah oh so Ooh. that's where i'm gonna go once we there? get back yeah yeah, yeah we should all go <laughs> okay awesome yeah i always love um whenever i'm in honolulu uh ra different ramen mm. Mm. and then ramen actually I've, I've started making my Shika, own yeah. um at home and uh, the last the last one was pretty good. Cup yeah. noodles. Nice. Cup noodles. Ah. <laughs> 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 yeah, no. Mm. Make a like a quick stock, mm -hmm. charring oh. some onion on the bottom and Ooh. throwing some like ginger and, and Oh, such. I could go for some tonkatsu mm -hmm. with the spare rib. Oh, oh, come on. Yeah. Let's stop at the let's stop at the noodle joint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Simon versus ramen, it's a nice uh, nice little healthy debate <laughs> on Oahu uh, amongst the locals. It's like, what's more local, oh. the Simon or the ramen? Yeah. But, uh, Hamura Simon, Kapa'a Kua'i. Yeah, oh, yeah so best. <laughs> I don't know, some people might go for the udon. I know there's that incredible oh, udon, udon place yeah. in Waikiki. Yeah, oh. yeah, that actually. A line on that place. Bro, there okay. is, but there's one in downtown Honolulu. And they're open like earlier hours. I think it's like from 11 to 3. Don't give like, away all our secrets. Time. I know. And it's great because you can do a la carte on tempura. Really? And they have all mm. like tempura tamago, the egg, you know, the sweet oh. egg, like oh wrapped in <laughs> tempura batter. Me. Just deep oh. fried. And, you know, personally, I'm not so much of like a tamago person, but when I had it, like with, in tempura, I was just mind blown um mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> Kukui, any, any, any no me oh no me i what's the spot in kula what's the spot in kula um uh, a lot of our our restaurants now are actually uh are, are closed um because yeah. of the water and uh, also some damage too but uh um, there's this one place that my classmates, my friends, family runs. It's the... Oh, speaking of squid. Oh, sure oh, enough. Sure. Um, but there's this one place up in Kulu called Silver Swords Inn. And it was actually a... And it's still a restaurant up in Kula, um that my friend's family runs. And wow. also my dad's family actually used to run it too. Wow. Um, back in the day before they became um, plantation farmers, a carnation plantation farmer. Um, but they had the most amazing house cake noodle Ooh. ever. Nice. Their sauce, their char siu, their wow. noodles. Are, it was so yeah. ono and <laughs> it was so good. And also, um, I know it's not a restaurant, but my mom, uh, she makes the most amazing pot stickers. So, mom, yeah. if you're listening, yeah, can I request uh, an order real quick? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Homemade pot stickers. Sounds mom will be so home, will be home yeah. in two weeks, mom. Come on. Yeah, pot yeah stickers. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Catalina? I was thinking um, St. Pete has a good variety of really good places, but I think the one that came to mind was a Venezuelan shop called oh. Eleven Chicks that does arepas. <gasps> oh, arepas! Filled. You can get them filled with like meats or egg or egg and cheese. Oh my, oh my gosh. gosh. Plantains, avocado. Oh my gosh. I, I have to stop. 
or else I'm just... Oh. Ronald was telling us about this that. Is, oh that's what he gosh. misses from He home. loves arepas. Yeah. So oh, well, I don't know if Val remembers from some of her time in Curacao, but Curacao is... Uh, I lived on the island of Curacao, which is actually in the, the Dutch... The Dutch Antilles in the Caribbean, which is a wow. bit silly, but uh, it's right off the coast of Venezuela. We could see Venezuela on a, on a clear day. Wow. Um, and uh, man, the arepas, it was, I must have gained like 30 pounds in two years. <laughs> so many arepas filled with all kinds of stuff. So it was, oh. oh, that was amazing. Curacao is a beautiful place, but uh, you can go there just for the arepas, I think. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, it's been a long time since I was there. Probably. <laughs> Uh, oh crap, I'm losing the years. Probably about 14 years ago. Oh, well, wow. that was about when I lived there. Hey. Hey, what's that fish? Look at that. What is that? Oh, hey, hey, little... hey. I don't yeah. think I've ever seen one of those before. Was it an oar fish? Because we have, a, we have a viewer who says, what's the odds of seeing an oar fish? We're probably oh. very, very low. <laughs> <laughs> we can just pretend. Yeah, yeah. that was an oar yeah. fish. You saw it. Yeah. They get quite large, don't they? I think so, yeah. Oh, that's funny. You can just pretend. Oh, whoa. Yeah. Just, I just Googled oar fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're huge, aren't they're they? They're so cool. <laughs> that is amazing. The viewer, Massive, the, wild looking fish. <laughs> the internet is ready for it, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll see one. Come on, oarfish. <laughs> we love all of you, our viewers. Thank you for uh, joining us for our uh, banter. Our on extended the, blue water talk. Our, mm -hmm. our blue water, blue yeah. water banter um, it, that got uh, incredibly meaningful um, and also was a really a lot of fun. We we are uh, getting close, uh, you know, getting closer to. Uh, the time when uh, we'll we'll need to be quiet and hand things over to operations so that they can, mm -hmm. you know, that's that might only be 10 or 15 minutes away. I don't wow. know. Yeah, we'll we see. just got under uh, 700 meters down. So yeah. We'll be starting up deck ops before too much longer. Yep. Amber, do you have a, a favorite place that you like to go oh. to, eat at, enjoy? That's a cool squid. Chris. Yes, um, so there's this uh, vegan vegetarian Thai restaurant that Ooh, they have mm. location in Seattle and, and as well in um, in California now. So uh, that's my like Friday night ritual usually. Yeah. <laughs> Friday night ritual, we love nice. that. Oh, Thai food is so good. Yeah, it's my favorite. I had it right before I came. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I love Thai. Yeah. Mango sticky rice. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, that's an excellent life what decision you guys right there. To me? <laughs> Come on. Life decision. <laughs> Wait, there are a lot of good quote life de oh. yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of good life decisions involve food. Yes, yes, yeah. Life is too short, I, you know. Yeah, you got you got to you got to enjoy that experience. Well, enjoy the people you're around. I don't. I I know you guys all know I've lived in quite a few places. One mm -hmm. of them being Thailand, and and honestly, uh, it's funny because in Curacao, if I think about Curacao, the mm -hmm. first thing that comes to mind is arepas and which is a good it's such a beautiful place i don't know why that should be the first thing but it is i think it's probably because i that's yeah. that was my most frequent interaction in all of curacao was with uh the wonderful aunties at the arepa counter where i could i could get my like 18 arepas for the day but uh in in thailand it's also mango sticky rice we had, there was a cart right outside my apartment gate and uh that served up uh, mango sticky rice <laughs> Oh, so I at least had one a day. Was yeah. that like a street food place? Yeah, oh and if I'm gosh. honest, I probably had four or five a day. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, so much good street food so around you guys the world. Are, you guys are yeah. taking me on a tour and making my <laughs> stomach so hungry. We still have an hour till oh, lunch. Crap. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hang in there, hang in there. There's a, another place on, in Maui at Maui Mall, I forget what it's called, but it's a really good Thai restaurant that serves the most delicious Pad Thai ever. Love mm. Pad Thai. And so mm. um, when I was in preschool, they've been around for all. So when I was in preschool, we had like a global heritage day. Um, mm. So you bring a food from um, uh, whatever your ethnicities were. And so my mother and grandmother um, are from Thailand. And... Um, so my mom bought a whole pan of pad thai from that oh, restaurant <laughs> and sent me to school with it. And yeah, mom. That's a winner. <laughs> That's a winner. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it. Oh, I didn't know that, Kukui. So cool you have Thai heritage. Uh, it's uh, such a special, special country. A lot of sacred places there. I've really enjoyed my time living there. Uh, 
I think Kukui is putting all of our favorite foods into sea log. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to type in squid luau instead of squid. Oh, squid luau, <laughs> let's go. Need some stew. Yeah. We got to see uh, a good a good friend of ours um, at a at a party with uh, with the, the Hokulea crew members uh, just last night. Mahina set up a, a ship to shore, and so we got zoomed into this uh, backyard paina and uh, Mark Naguchi, Gooch, otherwise known as Gooch, who's a very well known chef in our islands who does an amazing job of cooking his heritage of uh, i love what he says you you eat what get you just take all the local ingredients and turn them into these amazing cuisines and and uh i'm just imagining the taste of his squid luau squid yeah. luau so it would be so good I gooch know. it's good to see you last night mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I definitely think about that too. My mother and my grandmother always saying that where, wherever you go, if someone offers you food, especially in their home, you always take it, you always mm -hmm. eat it mm -hmm. and clean the plate, <laughs> you know, you, and then of course be very grateful. But I mean, that's something with Hanai family, um, as you Val and even Catalina have mentioned that you guys have this Hanai extended Ohana, um, extensions of yourself and the people that you love and the one thing about Hanai Ohana just as well as your own Ohana is that they will always host you and they will always feed you oh, fill the um, bellies and that's you know I know we've oh, spoken cool. a lot about connecting and I find that through food I <laughs> mean we all connect <laughs> through food yes absolutely I think food is one of those things that can you know allows you to cross cultural divides mm -hmm. you know it's so important in everywhere you look it's something that brings people to the table it starts conversations you know yeah. it's um it's <laughs> one of the most important social experiences i think we can have mm -hmm. you know yes. sharing food oh this is getting yeah I, this is getting bad though because i'm seeing questions <laughs> like uh, our audience wants us to talk about the ocean <laughs> <laughs> and I, I see i see a question Favorite deep water octopus species, and all I could think of was, oh, taco. I know. <laughs> some octopus. I know. Oh, sounds taco good. <laughs> sounds good. Oh, <laughs> well, yes. not, well, the so. uh, the Dumbo octopus is uh, Nautilus oh, favorite. That is a Nautilus yes. favorite. Yes. We would never eat Dumbo octopus. We no, don't tempura that no, guy. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the little pancake flapjack octopus, the yeah. little orange one yeah, with those the are little cute too. ears, and the, yeah. it's so adorable. <laughs> yeah, but if you fried it up right. Oh boy. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> I don't think I can eat octopus. Oh. Yeah. That's true. They're so intelligent, mad. right? They're yes. so amazing. Yes, octopus they are. such they're, incredible creatures. They're a very creatures, different yeah. type of intelligence too. So it's yeah. um, it's it's pretty amazing. Extraterrestrial intelligence. You so. remember yeah. that thing that went, oh, this was years ago, but there were some news articles about uh, an octopus that kept escaping an enclosure or either <laughs> yeah. in the back of a zoo or a lab or something. Right. Yeah. They're yeah. sneaky. They're so smart. Yes, they yeah, are. Figured out how to unscrew a jar that it was in. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're really smart. So intelligent. Like a big jar. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's amazing, and and they they don't have many like hard portions to their bodies, so they can fit through anything that their their beak can fit through, which is much smaller than than you imagine. Yeah. Um, it's it's pretty amazing. It's um, like a deep sea cat. <laughs> yeah, it really is. <laughs> Actually, I see that a lot. That yeah. <laughs> Like, Octopi you know. around the world, do not be insulted. <laughs> <laughs> you are way cooler than. Cats. I'm just saying, cats can squeeze through Amber, some pretty. Amber and I are like. <laughs> Amber disagree. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just making the connection because you know cats can wedge into some pretty small spaces. They can. They, they can get their head through. Usually, they can get the rest of themselves through. That's true. Yeah. Not always, but yeah. Cats are slippery beings. They, they get wedged as well. into some pretty interesting little corners now and again. Yep. Can't trust them, just like the octopus. Yeah. They're, they're these little agents of chaos. <laughs> and you know what? It keeps life interesting. It does, yes. Oh, man. Speaking of, my, uh, one of my larger cats, her name is Taco. And then Squid, Squid Taco. T-A-K-O. Uh, um, but she, her torso is so round and large that a lot of my friends, when they visit and come to our home, 
they call her Taco El Grande. Oh, yeah. Oh, and she, you know, oh. she doesn't fit into small places anymore. Uh, she lounges and naps on our couch, our oh. sofa arm, and sometimes we'll hear a thud oh, no. in the middle of the night. <laughs> and uh, uh, we realize that it's, oh, it's just Taco. She fell oh. off the couch into the ground. Uh, she oh. snores heavily, too. Oh, so does one of my cats. Yeah. Yeah. Look my at what we've done. <laughs> Look at what we've done to these feline species. It's so strange. There was one night not long after I moved to Maryland where uh, I, I'd gone to bed, was fast asleep, and at one point I woke up a little bit to uh, just turn over. And uh, all of a sudden, as I'm turning over, I feel something slide off of me and then a very surprised sort of chirp as it turns out one of my cats had been sleeping on my side and I just didn't even notice it and then I rolled over and she you just rolled over sort of pooped off. Yeah. No, I didn't roll oh. over on the cat, but uh, it was very surprising to both of us. But she was just like fast asleep on my side and I was fast asleep and never noticed and just balanced precariously there on my rib cage. Oh, so funny. Amazing. <laughs> one of my uh, guinea pigs, Huna, also <laughs> likes to fall off the couch and is a taco. And like he's a burying oh. animal, so he likes to see if he can like for some reason bury himself. My parents got this taco thing for him where he can like just hide in, but he likes to bury in it even though it's just like maybe half a foot wide. Oh my and God. then later on you hear this like soft thud on the carpet. <laughs> And they look over and they're like, oh, it's just Huna, he's fine. Huna. Oh my gosh. Oh, our clumsy pets. <laughs> you know, we were talking about octopuses a minute ago. <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Food, octopus. Well, we're talking about taco now. Yeah. Taco yeah. El Grande taco and, and Huna. Yeah. I would like to see pictures of everyone's cats after this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we can do a cat cam, though, for the audience, unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> That would make the internet go wild. We'd, our, yeah. our number of viewers would quadruple quick. Yeah. <laughs> internet loves cats. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a total meme, but yeah, cats are uh, a revered animal in ancient Egyptian culture, and they seem to be a revered animal in modern internet culture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Come full circle. Great we parallel. sure have. Yep. Uh, it's what thousands of years of so-called civilization will do to you. <laughs> Do you have any, it's uh, just us getting back heads? to our roots, right? <laughs> Amber's, I have two children. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> sound like they're a little bit like Huna and Taco. Sounds like yeah. sound like they're they're awesome. Uh, mm. But uh, we we tried. We had Pele the chameleon, oh. um, and uh, Pele Pele lasted about six months before requiring a burial at sea. Mm. And uh, yeah. So no, no, I, I live in a pretty small condominium and uh, cats would maybe be possible but are not desired by at least one person in my uh, four person family. Don't know, can't mm. figure out which one of those, which, <laughs> who's that one person. But. You know, it's usually the ones that put up the most objection to getting a cat that end up uh, closely yeah. bonded with the cat. <laughs> That's sure. funny. It's funny you say that I, um, I've never been a very big fan of cats, but was uh, on a recent trip with the family in New Zealand. We were staying at a friend's place who, taking care of their cat, Jasper, um, uh, that was undeniably a beautiful cat, but Jasper would, would come in every night and for some reason just decide that it needed to lay on my head <laughs> and, uh, and sleep right on the pillow right next to me and just purr oh. away all night. And oh. by the end of those couple weeks, uh, I was I I did have some small amount of affection for Jasper. So I, I was a softy. Oh, yeah. he's admitting he's professing his love for cats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> broke down and told us he actually loves cats. Oh my gosh, that's, that's reading a little bit into it, but uh, but I, I tolerated Jasper by the end. By the it's, end, it's a good sign when a cat tries to sleep on your head. Yeah, it is. it's probably yeah. going to happen with my tabby once oh I get back. It's a great gosh. sign of a. Affection. Oh, yes. well, yeah. I'm glad Jasper liked me. That was nice. <laughs> it, it may be a great sign of affection, but I don't always appreciate being woken up by having a cat belly descending on my yes. mouth. <laughs> yes. like, mm, yeah, I'd like yeah. to breathe, please. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got to watch cats. They don't really care about you breathing. So uh, <laughs> these guys are evil. These guys yeah. are evil. Evil creatures, but... Uh, oh, but they're so affectionate. Jasper sometimes. was good at pretending. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't believe it. You know, Jasper let the, let the kids kind of uh, pick him up and 
and hold it and oh, toss wow. it around. And I have not <laughs> seen cats that docile when being tormented like that. So, yeah, that yeah, was good. It was good. All right, we are at 350 meters. Wow, zipping right along. They're uh, <laughs> nearly lunchtime. It's been about lunchtime, taco. taco. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember one fascinating thing I learned about taco or octopus is that they have these, a lot of cephalopods have these water vascular features, which I think is why they like to, they can hide in these super small crevices, which is, I don't know. Sorry, it is random, cool. That's cool. Random thing that I thought of. That yeah, was cool. no, it is really interesting. They use their, they have very distinct structural, like uh, muscular structures and such. It's um, it's pretty amazing actually. They have several very different sort of like um, internal um, organs and and such. That is really very interesting. There's entire. I think there's a field of um, marine biology that's pretty much dedicated just to cephalopods. Yeah, they're <laughs> such complex creatures that, like, I, like we were saying before, like they're so intelligent, and even though they they don't have a nervous system like us, they still have a more complex nervous system, more mm -hmm. than like tinnophores and cnidarians. But um, they still have one of the most, I feel like, evolved capabilities of using their skills and using their adaptations to the best of their ability. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In some ways, that's, uh, that sort of distributed nervous system, right, where like each tentacle is sort right? of able yes. to operate with its almost its own mind. It's, yes. uh, it, it serves, it serves, uh, serves the or organism so well, you it know, does. a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so octopus is remarkable and uh, their ability to prof uh, solve problems and uh, and move through their environment. I've seen them squeeze into the tiniest of cracks and blend in, even out in the wide open, just com using their chromatophores, just completely transform into a rock right before my eyes. It's just really... It's remarkable. It's really amazing. Mm -hmm. Also, scares, it scares me at some points when I <laughs> accidentally try, try to tie off something on the substrate and it's right by a rock, but it's actually an octopus, and it just like crawls over <laughs> oh, my boy. head. I'm like, ow! Yeah. Has this happened more than once? Uh, just once. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that would freak me out a little bit too. Yeah, my friends heard, uh, said that she could hear me scream through my regulator. So. <laughs> oh, no. I love the uh, I love Kukui. Um, you have some affiliations too with Mega Lab, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Mega Lab has a has a, a permanent camera installed um, uh, just off the coast of Hilo there, and uh, um, we often get we often get octopus visiting the camera. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's also it's off the coast of Kona. I oh, wish we is. had one in Hilo, oh, okay. that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's off the coast of Kona. Oh, um, nice. And yeah, we do get frequent octopus visits. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty fun to watch. You can tune in if you if you Google Mega Lab and check out their website. I think you can get a link to their uh, to their camera. That's good to know. It's on the Kona side, so western yeah, side we have of a the couple island. of mega lab folks on this expedition. We do, mm -hmm. we do. There, it's an incredible. Uh, incredible laboratory and that, that combines science and technology and in environmental studies with uh, with a really good time uh, and, and adventure and uh, and uh, raising up an incredible generation of Kanako Eevee scientists uh, really really beautiful to see yeah there's a yeah our other mega lab on board Jacob Westling uh, our ROV engineering intern, and I think he's on the 12 to 4 watch. That's right, yeah. And he has some amazing projects going on with the Mega Lab. So. He is also a Lao Lao connoisseur. Oh. <laughs> yep. <laughs> It's coming back to food. You guys just yeah, won't that let it. We were talking about food the other day. Oh, that was awesome, yeah. Yes. Lao Lao connoisseur. Yeah, as, as you might guess, there there are a couple of, of uh, barbecues on board sitting out on the back deck, and many of us, um, on this watch at least, were I have been eyeing those things since we came on board, wondering <laughs> when we were going to get the fire up the grill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they're feeding us well, keeping us happy. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no issues with food. Yeah. There's plenty to go around, so, mm -hmm. and it's good. Cookie and cake time. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, cookie time um, is Ice thing. cream, gelato on Sundays, that lavender, awesome. vanilla. Yep, we had gelato after dinner vanilla last bean. night. Mm -hmm. that's, that's always something to look forward to. Yeah. All right, we are, uh, what's the technical um, the boundaries of the twilight zone? How deep does the twilight zone go? Are we in it? Are we in the twilight zone yet? Um, I believe we are. Let me check what our depth is. Okay, so we're at 290 meters. And um, I do believe that the, the twilight zone is sort of that in between area um, below the pelagic or below the surface where there's enough um, oh my goodness sunlight there we go that's the word <laughs> <laughs> and you're in the control van yeah. you forget about yeah, what is, no what is that thing that bright what shiny is thing that bright thing in the sky yeah. um, <laughs> the thing that's gonna blind us when we walk yeah. out of here yes. yeah <laughs> yeah but um yeah so the twilight zone i believe it is that portion of the ocean that is um there actually is some sunlight there but it is below the amount that um is a um allows for photo Par, photosynthetic available radiation. So it, it's too little sunlight for um, like phytoplankton. Yeah. Um, and so it's so that's below about 200 meters. Although that can change based on the amount of light changes also by like turbidity and and so like the amount of stuff that's there as well. Um, and I think it goes to about 1,000 meters. So there's oh, really? still wow. some light wow. um, that they're that is within that area, which is why I was talking about, that's, that's what I was talking about earlier, how, I mean, it's a very tiny portion of light, but this is why some of these organisms are able to identify when it's sun, when the sun's out versus, you know, when it's night is because even a, such a small change um, can actually have a great impact on, you know, their, um, their visibility and such. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know there's uh, a, a lot of attention being given to the productivity and, and, and uh, the biomass associated with the twilight zone, recognizing that there are so many, you know, similar to the deep sea, but maybe perhaps somewhat different. Uh, there's, there's suspected to be an abundance of uh, diversity, a lot of diversity in, right. in sea creatures that inhabit the, the sort of critical part of the water column, but it's as I think Val was talking about earlier, the, the water column is sort of understudied. So there's yeah. some new robots and things, some new sensors that we're sending out there to kind of explore this this region of, of the water column that we're in now. Um, but it's, uh, you know, that's sort of cutting edge science. I know Woods Hole really is engaged in a lot of that. and, and, and I um, actually just pulled up a page from Woods Hole Oceanographic oh. Institute. And hey, great minds think alike. How, um, <laughs> The, there, there's research that suggests that the amount of fish, the biomass, so, you know, the, um, this biomass of fish, the amount and the, the size and, um, within this twilight zone, so within that 200 to 1,000 meter zone, maybe 10 times greater than, than previously thought, which would actually out, outweigh, um, the rest of the ocean combined. Wow. Yeah. So, so this is where we're going to see the ore fish, in other words. That's what you're <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yes, actually this would be, but it's it, it's really interesting because if you think about it, this is the, one of the largest habitat, this is the largest habitat in the world. Yeah. <laughs> this by volume, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's so much, it's so large, um, and it, it is, you know, vastly underexplored. Um, and it includes the fish that I mentioned, but also zooplankton and crustaceans, these fish that we've been seeing, and as well as the like tinafores and other gelatinous organisms as well. Um, it's uh, it's pretty amazing, and some of the some of the adaptations that that you can see 
um, in these organisms that I think I highlighted on previously, but that this, uh, this Woods Hole page is mentioning is counter illumination because there is sunlight coming from, coming from above. Wow. Uh, be yeah, because there's light coming from above, they have like um, light spots on their bottom to break up their their, um, oh, their shadow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Super it's interesting. It's pretty amazing. A whole new set of adaptations, right, that creatures mm -hmm. would need to, to thrive in this this uh, zone yeah. in the ocean. And uh, so much we can learn here as well. And exciting to uh, to think about. All the exploring, you know, for any, if there are any younger viewers out there that, you know, that have maybe heard or felt like, oh, wow, there's, you know, science seems kind of cool, but there's not much left to explore. I've got to, like, go into outer space or something. Well... It's simply not true. The ocean right here on planet Earth, planet ocean, uh, there's so much that's yet to be discovered and so much work to do to understand how to care for this planet again as this global community, as we've expanded, swelled our population over, mm -hmm. are we over 8 billion now? Is it eight, over oh. 8 billion people? I think um, we did something like that. I, I feel yeah. like we did. We yeah, might have. so I mean, so many people, constant moving, you know, I love those uh, images, uh, of all the flights happening at, at, at a time or all it's of the ships out at sea. And there's just so much that we really have to, to tune in to what yep. the Earth is telling us, uh, mm -hmm. what our planet is telling us about how to best fit in to this ecosystem on, on planet Earth. And uh, understanding the ocean is going to be so critical in that. And uh, so to all of you young explorers out there, there's a lot of work to do. We need your help. We want you mm -hmm. on board the Nautilus. We want you. Uh, we want you inside those laboratories and yes. and mm -hmm. uh, out in the field doing the work, caring for these spaces, uh, uh, studying these spaces in whatever ways you're, is relevant to you and your cultures and your communities, and and uh, coming together to sort of share that knowledge so that we can we can do the work of caring for this place. Yeah, by all means, our sciences are for everyone because. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's us. That's it. That's all we are. All mm -hmm. we'll ever be. Mm -hmm. Ew. All right. Looks like we're beginning to transition out of the twilight zone and into sort of near surface waters. We're. Uh, just under 170 meters. Just under 170 so meters. So they're starting here. to uh, get can things tell there's ready. more light. Actually, mm -hmm. it's amazing because we're still quite yeah. deep, right? This is over 500 feet deep, but but we're uh, you're still I don't know. Could just be the camera, but it feels like there's yeah. more light coming in. There is a little bit more. Yeah, the deck crew and bridge are getting ready for recovery. Uh, front rows getting ready for the recovery as well. So. Mm -hmm. Things will start springing into action topside you're very shortly. You're welcome, Internet. It's time for me to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a story about that, but I won't. I'll tell it on another watch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So after we recover Atalanta, we'll be uh, commencing on some uh, seafloor mapping in the area, and we'll be doing that for a little while. But there are more dives to come, much more things to learn, and uh, we hope uh, that you'll stay with us for that.
Go ahead. We are ready for the 50 meter pass over. Or, um, <clears throat> Copy that. Let me get my Quickly people to our assembled. viewer interested in, can we see Hope okay. Relay setting in the west? We can. Entire star compass. Bridge, so bridge, back deck. Are we clear to proceed with recovery? Signing off. Deck bridge, uh, clear to proceed. Okay, copy that. We are pulling her up. It's a pretty cool perspective on Nautilus that we're seeing. It sure is. Yeah, welcome back at Atlanta after a very successful, just incredible dive. Wow. Okay, hooks are on. Control band, please secure power. Power secured. Power secured. 